Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. I hope the afternoon dip is already gone. Um, and uh, uh, thanks uh, to the organization of this, this great uh, day with such a nice exchange of uh, information and experience. Uh, my name is Jan Smolders and I'm actually independent uh, consultant or client advisor for solving groundwater remediation. Um, so, um, in this uh, presentation I first will do a short self-introduction, then we're going to compare soil groundwater remediation in Netherlands versus China. Um, I will also uh, show some typical differences in approaches and, um, and then I will show some showcases from remediation projects in China and in the end I will give some suggestions or hopes how um, Netherlands and China can collaborate in the future. So, um, in Europe I have been uh, doing this, this kind of things for about 22 years. I've done uh, toxicological research, uh, I have done analysis uh, research for environmental components. Most of the time actually I have been doing solid groundwater investigation and remediation. And I also did something about international projects to implement European environmental legislation in Eastern European countries who wanted to become a member of the EU. Um, in China, I, I came here at the end of 2005, around Christmas, and then um, mainly I have been involved in um, soil and groundwater remediation and investigation. I started working with a US-English um, uh, consultancy, uh, and they asked me to come to China to develop soil and groundwater remediation. Because at that time, they did a lot of investigation, but then they found it was contaminated. And then they had to tell the client to advise, you know, to do additional investigation and remediation, but they didn't know how to do that, so they were a bit scared to give this advice. So then they asked me to, you know, to come up to fill this gap. Um, apart from soil remediation, I have been involved in renewable energy projects and also uh, in sustainable development and climate change. And especially that renewable and sustainable stuff I have been doing also in Thailand, Laos, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, Korea, Philippines, and even Australia. Um, well, you know, basically, I'm just uh, a playing captain, and I'm not scared to get mud on my shoes. That's, that's of, uh, my, my typical uh, character. Okay, the Netherlands versus China. Um, I hope you like the photo. Uh, the Netherlands versus China. The Netherlands is uh, only 37,000 square kilometers, while uh, China is um, nine and a half million square kilometer, and uh, Netherlands is only 0.4 percent uh, of the area of China. So, if if I would show these two maps on the same scale, you can see in the middle the small um, this one. This is this is actually Netherlands on the same scale as China. So it's quite small. Legislation. Um, in Holland, there is one ministry, Infrastructure and Environment, which covers everything. That's easy to cope with. In China, actually, there are four ministries involved, which is Environmental Protection, then there is Land and Resources, there is also Water Resources, and there is um, a Ministry of Housing and Urban uh, Redevelopment. Um, so, in, in Holland, as part of the um, soil protection law, there is one circular soil remediation which contains those famous target and, and remediation uh, action values for all parameters for soil and groundwater. Um, but nevertheless, apart from that, there are two other relevant laws and there are six decisions and six regulations about soil and groundwater remediation, three mandates and two water circulars. In China, it's not so clear because everything is actually still under development and under discussion. Um, but nevertheless, Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, Jiangsu province and Zhejiang province, they developed already some kind of remediation thresholds or legislation for soil. Um, regarding when do you need to start remediation? Uh, in Holland there is this definition of a case of serious impact. And this means when there is a case of serious impact, you have to do remediation. It's obliged then. In China, nothing like that has been defined yet. So, this is more or less the, uh, the history of environmental legislation in China. 
Uh, I'm not going to read this up completely, but um, the most important from this slide is that in 2009 uh, there have been drafted guidelines for soil remediation, which since then actually is still under discussion. Um, because there are already a lot of problems and something needs to be done. Uh, at the same time in 2009 there has also been issued interim measures on management of urgent soil pollution at contaminated sites which basically is also still a draft. Now, the last two uh, cells, a soil remediation law and a groundwater remediation law. So we have the question mark here and we all hope that this can be filled in as quickly as possible. The expectation is still that this will be rolled out in 2015, but we don't know, we still have to wait. Um, yeah, this again shows a bit about which legislation is currently already rolled out in China. Um, and about standards, it has already been uh, shown today. There are environmental quality standards for soil, and there are also environmental quality standards for groundwater. I think Dr. Leo has already uh, shown them today. It's standards which, which shows basically a grade of quality of them, but it's not a remediation threshold or a remediation standard. But they are sometimes used for this purpose. And then one more important difference is that in the Netherlands, asbestos is also a parameter uh, in, in the investigation and in the uh, remediation uh, decision making. So if there is too much asbestos in the soil, there should also be taken place remediation. In China, actually, nobody already thinking about asbestos at all. And as I said before, Shanghai, Beijing, Chongqing, Zhejiang, and Shenyang, they have already rolled out some kind of uh, legislation because they have the problems and they have to do a lot of uh, brownfield redevelopment. So, yeah, they need to have something. And for instance, Shanghai, when they had a world expo there, they developed quickly some soil cleanup standards, especially for expo sites. So then, you know, they could uh, prepare the, the, this old industrial area for the expo. Okay, some geography hydrology. Netherlands is mainly delta area, as you can see on, on this, this map. And that from rivers coming from Germany, Switzerland, uh, France, Belgium. Uh, so at least half of Netherlands, you could say, is delta area, generally flat, a ground level below sea level, clay, silty, sandy clay, layered with sand lenses, and uh, the sand piles already mentioned today, which could be uh, an important uh, route of, of uh, downwards migration of um, uh, contaminants. That's man-made, of course. Huh? Hollowed and shallow groundwater tables, often the standing water layer, uh, salty seepage, in Holland called quell, often takes place. And, of course, in the southeast and the east, these areas, uh, it's a bit higher ground level and um, it's basically sandy material, the geology. Um, the highest mountain in, in Holland, you can show, see it there, this is the highest mountain in Holland, the Valserberg, 323 meter below ground level. Uh, higher than ground level, sorry. So in China there's a huge variation of course because it's a very big country but um, the main areas economically and also the main areas for uh, soil and groundwater investigation and remediation are actually uh, several delta areas and in those delta areas the geology is also clay, silty, sandy clay, layered with sand lenses, um, a, a, the groundwater table not too deep, also often a standing water layer um, so, but if you go further inland, of course, there is deserts, grassland, mountains, and China's highest mountain is the Mount Everest. That's completely different. That's more than 8,800 meter. So the main river deltas in China is Yangtze River, uh, Changjiang, Yellow River, Huanghe, and the Pearl River, Zhujiang. So um, actually, what I always say, you know, the geology uh, compared uh, with each other, Netherlands and China. It's more or less the same, except that in Holland the sea is west side and in China the sea is east side. So these two pictures, um, it looks quite similar, but the difference is this is the sunset and this is the sunrise. So, but it looks quite the same, but that's the difference. 
history. In Netherlands, it's already mentioned today, the first case was Lekker Care in 1980. That's the time that the photos were still black and white. And yeah, the stupid thing there was they first built a urban uh, new residential area and then they discovered the contaminants and they had to do a very complicated excavation under the new buildings. In China, the Beijing company on their website, they claim that Song Jia Zhang remediation in 2007, which is this photo, was the first remediation done in China. Um, but uh, I know from ERM, they had already finished the remediation when I started working there, so that was before 2006, so uh, that is earlier, so, well, this is something we need to discuss later. Um, the takeaway question for today is, uh, in Holland, this lekker kerk was discovered after they built a new residential area. Um, the takeaway question is, how many this kind of lekker kerks will still be discovered in China in the future? I think a lot. In Holland, um, the government decided that after 2013, they will spend no more money on soil remediation. Uh, currently, uh, it's estimated that the market parties already spent 75% of the money and the government still spends 25%. Uh, nevertheless, for some uh, situations and projects, government has decided in the period from 2010 to 2014, they will still spend 893 million euro government money on soil and groundwater remediation. Um, and then there is also a budget for urban re rehabilitation and the market who pay 75%, that's mainly companies and uh, project developers. Potential sources for financing in China. Now the government has decided to spend, uh, 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 allocate many, a lot of budget for remediation. Um, urban uh, areas like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Chongqing, they spend money when they do uh, urban development. So they move out the old, the old industrial sites and do the brownfield redevelopment. Um, there are large-scale regional impacts from long-term polluting industry and mining. Um, basically, you would say in China the polluter pays, but in this case it's all state-owned companies, so the, the state will pay anyway. Uh, there are also multinational companies who do remediation in China, because they you know, they establish a joint venture, they take over industrial sites in China and according to their corporate policy, they have to do it. Uh, but it's not requested according to the Chinese legislation, but they still do. And in the future this could also be the case for Chinese companies, but that's not less, that's not really already uh, practiced nowadays. Okay, this is about the 12th, 5th year plan on environmental protection. Uh, which has been rolled out in China and as part of this there is also a 12th, 5th year plan on integrated heavy metals pollution, prevention and treatment and then 40 billion RMB already has been allocated and apart from that for the Shang River in Hunan province which is an area very much um, polluted uh, they have already allocated also 40 billion RMB to clean up this whole area and this already has been uh, started actually. There is also a national soil protection plan 2011-2015 and the national groundwater pollution prevention and remediation plan which goes from 2011 till 2020 and in which also 40 billion RMB has been allocated. So the money should not be the problem. And Shangjiang River is the first region approved by the State Council to be treated with a comprehensive plan for this heavy metal pollution. I think there are some people in, in, in this uh, meeting today who are already working on this. Beijing, Chongqing, Guangzhou, they have already more than 100 polluting enterprises who have been relocated because it's uh, nowadays becoming more and more urban area. So this is uh, brownfield redevelopment, ur uh, urban revitalization. Uh, Shenyang, Jiangsu, Zhejiang province, they also have, have moved away many industrial sites and polluting enterprises and now have to, you know, to face the, the soil remediation to, to develop the, these kind of areas for future urban use. The arena and its players in the Netherlands have companies like 
consultancy is like Arcadis, Witteveen en Bos, Tau, Diaves, Koning, etc. Uh, contractors, um, laboratories. Uh, Icocop is here also today. Uh, what I want to say is that these companies are already long time established companies his, with a history about 20 till 100 years or even more. In China, uh, I have listed here uh, many, many companies because now in China actually it's like mushrooming companies who want to start to get en engaged in um, environment, in soil and groundwater remediation. And I think this list is even not, not complete. Uh, you can say these are like more or less government or university institutions. Then there are the, the, the companies, uh, some laboratories, and there are the, the, the foreign companies who also try to get a piece of the cake in China. Um, so the interesting thing is that maybe the history of these companies in China is like uh, between a half and ten years old. So that's a, a big difference between Holland and China. So you can see it's very much uh, not yet established in China. Typical differences in investigation. In Holland, is actually majority is hand augering because everything is shallow. While in China, there is a, a lot of use of mechanical hull or stem auger or rotary drill. I think there are already about six geoprobes active in China. Um, in China, the geoprobes have a, a membrane interface probe, MIP. And in China, there's also use is made of soil gas survey. In Holland, everything is so much uh, org uh, regulated that still nowadays in situ measurements are not well accepted. So you still need to take samples and bring them to the laboratory. Uh, though I see Martin is shaking his hand a bit, so maybe it's, there is some, something going on, but you can tell me later. In Holland, it includes asbestos, as I, asbestos, I mentioned already, but in China, asbestos is not yet uh, included. Um, for the, for the uh, intervention values in Holland, they are actually recalculated based on organic matter and, 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 and lutein. It's not done in, in China. Um, if you find a contamination in Holland, you need to fulfill requirements regarding delineation and regarding uh, preparation of remediation plan, etc. So this is very much uh, detailed in Holland, while in China, still now, you know, there is no regulation about it. So often a quite of quick conclusion is taken and uh, rather than uh, delineation and uh, preparing a detailed conceptual site model, already quickly action is taken, if there is any action at all. In Holland, the human risk assessment is not so necessary, actually, and, and also quite limited, because it's already, you know, the, the, the intervention values are already risk-based, so if you have a case of of remediation necessity, you, you don't need the human risk assessment so much. While in China, human risk assessment is quite often used in those cases that, that uh, investigation takes place. So, if you plan to do a remediation in Holland, you, you need to uh, submit your plan to the, to the local government and they need to approve it first. In China, you can still do what you want because there is no legislation. Um, in Holland, we have seen today there is numerical modeling is, is, is used, but maybe in China it's more popular uh, because I think there is more academic input in China and there is no, no clear standards, so, so you need to do modeling to, to, to uh, estimate what's going to happen with your blooms. So, uh, yeah, this is the geoprobe in China. Uh, I think already six, about six in use. And this is the MIP, Membrane Interface Probe, which is very useful to do in situ delineation. But I have to say that I have seen some projects where they use it for the chlorinated hydrocarbons delineation, which is a very tricky thing, because it's a very sensitive detector, and it's very sensitive for, for air, for oxygen. So you can easily get uh, wrong uh, information. So I have seen people who have been interpreting all those signals for more than two weeks, but actually it was just uh, background, uh, but they didn't know. So yeah, be aware of this. Um, for remediation, um, I mentioned already that um, in Holland you need approval for your remediation action plan. Uh, in Holland it's maybe 50-50 soil remediation and groundwater remediation. China at the moment is basically focused on soil. Um, in Holland it's a bit of everything. There are industrial sites, brownfields, 
But there are also already many, many, many small sites like dry cleaner sites, gas retail station, etc. Uh, metal workshops, just in the city, you know, they found also contamination. And this also needed to be uh, cleaned up. In China, actually, the small sites like dry cleaners, where they use the, 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 the petrol ethylene, it's still quite overlooked. Nobody taking care about that now. So, remedial approach for soil. In Holland, most popular maybe is excavating and soil washing and reuse, encapsulation with a living layer, monitoring registration, in situ or ex situ bio treatment, thermal treatment, uh, in situ chemical oxidation. In China, um, dig and dump, dig and dump and then use in cement kilns, in situ or ex situ chemical stabilization, immobilization. This is very popular in China. Um, it's possible to do it here, and I think in Holland it has been tried in the past, but it was not really much accepted by, by the authorities. So that's an important difference, I think. In China now, this is becoming more and more popular to do it that way. And then after uh, the stabilization, immobilization of the soil, uh, it could be used, reused for backfill of the site, and it could be used for producing uh, bricks. And ISCO is also used in China. And for groundwater, uh, there are many typically approaches in Holland, but in China there is not so much groundwater remediation already. And so if it's done, it's mainly pump and treat or maybe it's uh, air spicing and soil vapor extractions in some cases. Now, here are some uh, real cases. In Guangzhou, where we are today, there have been uh, some brownfield redevelopments like the former cement plant in the Liwang district and there was another plant in the Haichu district where they also did a brownfield redevelopment. Then there was the Jiangye Chemical Substances Factory in Tianhe, that's close to here. And there was also a sulfuric acid factory. Um, this is already been done, I think, five years ago or so. And then later on, um, the government had more or less, when they evaluated, had to admit that maybe with all the knowledge of nowadays, they would have done it different and they agreed that not all the impacts might have been addressed adequately. But people live again now. In Beijing, there was the Beijing chemical plant, uh, 2007. So this is, was pretended to be the first soil remediation project in China. Uh, here it was excavation, cement kiln incineration and solidification, segregating and landfilling, 65,000 cubic meter. And now the area is uh, residential use. Uh, this was something quite similar also in Beijing, Beijing Red Line Coatings Plant, also in 2007. Uh, same approach, 140,000 cubic meter. Um, the Dyche Stuff Plant in Beijing in 2008. Uh, here the approach was thermal disruption and then also cement kill incineration and solidification and also for residential use. Um, Shanghai, the expo site, I mentioned that already. What they basically did there was um, uh, remove all the, 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 the actually not remove, they, they called it remove, but it was solidification and stabilization of the, the heavy metals and the, the persistent organo, organic uh, uh, stuff. And uh, for this purpose, they used their self developed remediation standard for a soil quality assessment for exhibition sites because that had to become an exhibition site. But the values, the remediation values, are much higher, for instance, compared with the touch intervention values. But it worked in, 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 in this way. Then um, Nanjing, Jiangsu. Uh, this is a project I have been involved in myself. Uh, this was Chromium-6. Chromium-6 is a main issue in China. There are many, many sites contaminated with Chromium-6 in groundwater. Um, this site we have been doing uh, delineation, pump tests, and then we, we cleaned up the hot spot sources. And we had a plume interception program with pump and treat remediation technology. And we also did the long-term monitoring. In Fujian, there has been done a biopile treatment of a TPH contamination. Um, you know, this was all very experimental because it was kind of the first time happening in China. So it's just, you know, to stimulate aerobic uh, degradation. So in, in this pile, you can see some, some tubes which actually have the purpose to, 
to, to aerate the pile and then that way um, the biological degradation has been stimulated. In Shanghai there was a site with a lot of uh, tea apple, so you can see this um, this, this water sample, groundwater sample, the, the dark material, the dark liquid, is, is the dean apple and it has only a little, little bit of water above it. So the, the dean apple layers were, were there about uh, one meter. Um, and it was on top of a very silty clay layer. The problem there was that uh, the site was uh, meanwhile in a in residential area and um, we did a three-dimensional three dynamic modeling based on the GMS platform to, to model the DNA pool and the plume development to, to show that uh, you know, when there was a risk that the plume would uh, cross the borders uh, because the, the owner was actually quite scared that the residents living close to this site uh, would make trouble once they knew that and there were also some, some groundwater wells. So there was a DNA recovery system installed as a first uh, stage of the remediation which uh, with which more than 300 liter TCA had been recovered. Uh, another one, uh, groundwater remediation for uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons in Dongguan, also here in this area. This was electronic toy manufacturing facility. Um, the interesting thing is we use soil gas survey to, and then with the soil gas, gas survey with direct PID measurements we found the source which was a, a leaking sewer system uh, where the chlorinated hydrocarbons uh, had, had been uh, disposed in. Uh, for this delineation we used the membrane interface probe, probe for, the, for the first time in China and um, we also had to do indoor air measurements because there was also uh, uh, natural biodegradation with the production of fungal chloride which is carcinogenous. So we did uh, indoor air me measurements and human risk assessments and then finally we uh, did um, remediation with uh, air sparging and soil vapor extraction which worked very well and basically this was you know uh, all first time that, that this kind of uh, in in was uh, designed and developed and used in China. I actually don't know why my photos overlap the text because at home it was still okay but okay I have to deal with that. This is the case that um, has been done before 2006, a pump and treat approach for uh, ethyl benzene uh, on a site, an industrial site somewhere in Henan province, which could be the first remediation project in China. If anybody in the audience knows another project which has been early, then I'd like to know that. This was an interesting case in Beijing, in a food plant, where there was a diesel fuel remediation. Um, Beijing, the groundwater table, when we started this investigation, it was like 60 meters. But, you know, the whole decision-making process, how to, to, which approach to choose for this remediation, it took years and years. So, uh, once we started remediation, the groundwater table already had been dropped to almost 22 meters, so even we had to install new, new uh, monitoring wells because the, uh, the monitoring wells already didn't reach the groundwater anymore. Um, but anyway, the, the contaminant was still in the soil and hadn't reached the groundwater yet. And they had a boiler and, and they had steam on the side. So when I was there, I said, okay, let's use the steam to do the remediation. So we injected steam and then um, we did a soil vapor extraction and we also had um, some minor groundwater abstraction to make sure that if uh, the contaminants were leaking through and reached the groundwater that they didn't spread out uh, crossing the border of the, of the area but that it still was recovered. Um, the interesting case was what we found that the, uh, just the, the solar vapor wells contained a lot of uh, dual phase, a lot of free phase which we didn't expect but that was you know like an easy way to to, to recover contaminants, which we did, and which, which, which worked very for well. So this remediation and all the other cases I have shown uh, already have been finished um, and, and have been very successful. In Hunan province there was a brownfields redevelopment. This, re this developer had to uh, 
developed residential area and it was an old chemical and petroleum refinery complex with all the kind of um, contaminants you could expect there. So the, the site was very dirty, you could say. And um, it reached still about 11, 12 meters below ground level. Um, to excavate all this would become too much expensive and then the developer could, could not have a profitable project anymore. So then, you know, we came up with a, with a Dutch solution, which is the encapsulation and the living layer. So what finally was done was only excavation of the 5 meter top layer, and then under this 5 meter, the contaminant was still in place, but there was, um, it was backfilled with clean soil, and then between the 5, layer, the five meter layer of clean soil, and then the, the, the contaminants that under there, there was a, a clay layer uh, to separate it, and there was also a layer uh, a signal layer that you could see if you would dig a hole uh, and you could go deeper than five meters that you would reach the contaminated uh, soil. This was the first case I think that um, this kind of approach has been done in China. Um, so, um, I mentioned already soil stabilization and immobilization is, is very popular now in China and I know there is already like four to six companies who have developed their own secret magic agent to do this and they don't want to give you the information about it, huh? what it's exactly, huh? um, they want to sell it to you of course. But basically it's a very simple simple principle because um, porcelanic material is material like uh, limestone or volcanic ash, fly ash, this material is very well uh, uh, suited to absorb heavy metals. So if you use some porcelanic material and mix this with cement, then you have ideal uh, agent for, for the solidification and stabilization. So that's the secret I tell you today. Um, so these mixes can bind inorganic substances like heavy metals. It can be used both in situ and ex situ. But in situ problem, as I have seen in some projects, has many problems with the mixing because the agent needs to be mixed uh, with, with the contaminated soil. But when it's clay, and it's difficult to mix, you know, and if then it also starts to rain, then it becomes one big mess, which I have seen in practice. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that this approach does not remove the impacts, they are still in place, but they are not harmful anymore. So after, um, after you do this stabilization, immobilization, ex situ, you can use, you can reuse the, the, the material as backfill, or you can use it for brick production, which is done in practice. Uh, it's also used for Gromium-6, combined with reduction of Gromium-6 to Gromium-3 to make the, the Gromium-6 uh, uh, disappear, uh, because Gromium-3 is not toxic and Gromium-6 is very toxic. Now, let's talk about Dutch-Chinese collaboration. Um, I think there is a lot of intelligence and experience, both in Holland, Embo and in China. And as I have shown a bit in my presentation, it's complementary. So, like the approaches chosen in China is different from, from Holland and opposite. So I think Dutch and Chinese can learn a lot from each other. And it's, um, okay, we can easily, you know, we, we can easily uh, do projects in each other country because as I showed before, the geology is more or less the same. And as the photos show, uh, there's an example of teamwork, Dutch and, and Chinese together. There's one, one Dutch guy on, on this photo, uh, that one. Okay, so uh, my suggestion would be uh, for collaboration in the future, um, doing real remediation projects together in China and in the Netherlands, rather than only visiting each other, like on, on the photos. And, um, well, I think a good start has already been made regarding this collaboration um, last week. Because this is the, for the people that know, this is the, the Dutch minister president together with Xi Jinping, Chinese president. They met each other last week and shake hands. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions?